Palestinians stage a nationwide general strike across the occupied West Bank and Arab towns in Israel to protest the ongoing Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip. At a summit hosted by France on the financing of African economies, African leaders call for vaccine patents to be lifted amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In Italy, migrant farm workers gather outside Parliament to demand the government better working conditions. From the headquarters of Telesuri English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South. I'm Gladys Quesada. On Tuesday, Palestinians staged a nationwide general strike across the occupied West Bank and Arab towns in Israel to protest the ongoing Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip. The general strike was called by the Palestinian parties and unions over Israel's military escalations in Gaza and Jerusalem. The strike also seeks to protest against Israeli settlers' violence, the evictions of Palestinians from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, and days of assaults on the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. According to Andalou news agency, shops, business centers, civil institutions, banks, and universities closed their doors across the West Bank as part of the general strike. A Palestinian man was killed and more than 70 wounded, including 16 by live fire, in clashes with Israeli troops on the outskirts of Ramallah, according to the Palestinian Authority Health Ministry. Two Israeli soldiers were injured. On Tuesday, Israeli forces launched new airstrikes on the Gaza Strip as the attacks enter its ninth day. The Palestinian Ministry of Health recorded a death toll of 213 since the attacks began, including 61 children and 36 women, and more than a thousand others have been injured. The latest offensive, which has displaced 58,000 Palestinians from their homes, also destroyed a COVID-19 test laboratory which supplied COVID-19 vaccines and tests, as well as provided attention to pregnant women. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs stated that most displaced people are being protected in 50 schools alongside the Gaza Strip. On Tuesday, in several cities of Indonesia, including the capital Jakarta, Indonesians protested against the ongoing Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip. Protesters gathered in front of the United States Embassy as well as the United Nations mission in Jakarta to condemn the ongoing Israeli bombing on the besieged Gaza Strip and the violations in Jerusalem, including the evictions of Palestinians from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood and invasions of holy sites. The demonstrators waved Indonesian and Palestinian flags and carried banners denouncing U.S. support in favor of Israel. In the meantime, Malaysia shows solidarity with the people of Gaza by lighting up the Kuala Lumpur Tower in the Palestinian national colors. The tower has been illuminated with red, white and green, and the display will continue until the end of this week as part of the Southeast Asian country's support to the cause of the Palestinian people. Also in Argentina, demonstrators gather in front of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires to show support for the Palestinian people. There have been already 55 children killed, so neither children nor women nor civilians are spared from the barbarism of this state. And the truth is that it will continue to go on because its interest in this place, backed by the U.S. imperialism, is precisely to quash all the rebellions in the Middle East. And that is why international solidarity is fundamental. All international solidarity to repudiate the genocidal state of Israel and to give it all the support of the Palestinian people. Peace activists in the United Kingdom have called for an investigation into if UK weapons have been used in the Israeli carpet bombing of Gaza. Since 2015, the UK has alliances over $560 million worth of arms to Israel, according to a governmental review. About 12 licenses for arms are likely to have been used in the 2014 bombardment of Gaza, the campaign against arms trade said. 
Currently, there are 43 open licenses for unlimited UK arms exports to Israel, mainly for aircraft. The UK also participates in the construction of United States F-35 combat planes, which Israelis are using against the Palestinian people. On Monday, the US announced a line of missile supplies for Israel worth of almost $800 million. While UK and the US leaders call Israel for restraint, these are clear signs of political support for the occupation and blockade and the violence that is being inflicted on the Palestine people for decades, the NGO said. Thousands of pro-Palestinian demonstrators rallied in cities across the United States on Tuesday, calling for an end to the worst Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip in years. Demonstrators took to the streets of Midtown Manhattan in New York, gathering near the Consulate General of Israel. Meanwhile, others took to the streets to, in cities such as Boston and Michigan, waving Palestinian flags and holding placards that read, End Israeli apartheid and freedom from Gaza. Protesters also denounced the war crimes committed by the Israeli regime in Gaza. I'm Palestinian and I have family in Palestine and I have to do whatever it takes. My existence itself is resistance and I need to fight for my family to be safe. Everyone has the right to be on their homes without being ethnically cleansed or be threatened to be completely erased, and that's what Palestinians are going through. Because I'm Palestinian. Also in the United States, hundreds demonstrated in support of Palestine outside the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday, demanding an end to Israeli airstrikes in the Gaza Strip. President Biden and his administration have come under pressure to condemn Israel's escalation of attacks on Palestinians. However, the Biden administration has continued to voice support for its ally and Israel's supposed right to defend itself. More news coming up after the break. Stay with us. The life is full of moments, moments of fight, moments of hope, moments that transcend, moments that you can live in. Telezur Documentaries, Sundays, only on Telezur. Telesur brings to your screen a special program analyzing an interview by British researcher John McVoy, where he exposes the alliance between the United Kingdom and the coupist Venezuelan opposition and their conspiracies to overthrow the legitimate government of the Bolivarian nation. Today, only on Telesur. Welcome back to From the South. At a summit held on Tuesday and hosted by France on the financing of African economies, African leaders called for vaccine patents to be lifted amid the COVID-19 pandemic. The summit saw the participation of two dozen African heads of state and representatives of global financial institutions, including the chief of the IMF. There is not enough mobilization on that side from our populations. It's a certain anxiety that is due to the fact, in my opinion, that the vaccine comes from elsewhere. That's why it is necessary to aim for vaccine production in Africa. I think that will have a fairly big impact on people's attitudes. On Africa. The first initiative is a very strong initiative to massively produce vaccines in Africa for Africa, and therefore to develop through financing and industrial partnerships a capacity to produce all types of vaccines in Africa. 
des vaccins de tout type. In Brazil, former foreign minister Ernesto Araujo denied interference by the United States government in negotiations with Russia for the acquisition of the Sputnik V coronavirus vaccine. Ernesto Araujo made a statement during his appearance before the Senate Commission investigating the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic by President Jair Bolsonaro. When questioned about the subject, the former Brazilian minister indicated that he had no knowledge of any interference by Washington in this sense. Araujo made the statement despite the fact that the U.S. government report during Donald Trump's administration stated that the White House persuaded the Brazilian executive not to buy Spagni V. The Jair Bolsonaro decision to ignore the pandemic led to a health crisis affecting more than 20 Brazilian regions. Hundreds of demonstrators marched in the streets of Port-au-Prince on Tuesday, once again demanding Haitian President Jovenel Moïse to resign from office. Protesters are also calling for Moïse to drop an upcoming constitutional referendum scheduled for June 27th, which was unilaterally proposed by his administration. As protesters took to the streets, Moïse called for political opponents to discuss the future of the country and put an end to the infighting, which he said is delaying the development of the country. The meeting between the National Strike Committee and the government of Colombia once again failed to reach an agreement on warranties regarding the list of social demands proposed against Ivan Duque's government. To this scenario is added that the highly criticized decision of the president of ordering the public forces to deploy their maximum operational system to recover mobility on the roads, some of which were blocked in the context of the massive mobilizations against Duque's government. The conglomerate of social organizations reported that Duque's administration refused to offer guarantees for a social protest in Colombia, a condition to negotiate a solution to the current crisis in the country. They claim that the real response received from the government to their demands to start negotiations was the brutal police violence unleashed since Sunday in the municipality of Yumbo, where at least one person died and more than 20 were injured. This Tuesday, Colombia's President Ivan Duque ordered a full deployment of the military and public forces to dismantle the protests in the municipality of Yumbo, in southwestern Colombia. For a second night in a row, military troops occupied the streets in Yumbo to clear the demonstrations and to impose terror among the people. The protests in Colombia, which began on April 28th against the government's non-withdrawn tax reform proposal, also demand, among other issues, the cessation of police brutality, the strengthening of a mass COVID-19 vaccinations and basic income of at least a monthly legal minimum wage. Meanwhile, a delegation from the government, led by the High Commissioner for Peace, Miguel Ceballos, met for the second consecutive day with the National Strike Committee, with the aim of establishing a negotiation table to find a way out of the country's social crisis. On Tuesday, the Colombian President Ivan Duque called on the maximum deployment of Colombia's security forces, while his peace commissioner rejected strike leaders' demands to end the violent repression of peaceful protesters. Duque declares war on the strike when he orders to deploy the maximum of military and police forces on the sites of peaceful concentration in the country. Despite the fact that more than 50 people have been murdered, more than 1,500 have been detained, nearly 500 have disappeared, despite the fact that international humanitarian law has been violated, despite the fact that more than 20 women have been abused by some members of the national police, the government refuses to respond to these clear acts of violence that have been repudiated by the international community. For this reason, once again, we say to Duque, stop the massacre, President Duque. In Chile, after suffering a crushing defeat in past weekend elections, a group of right-wing lawmakers introduced on Tuesday a constitutional reform bill to protect now privately held pension funds from future attempts of nationalization. Chileans were forced under duress 
in the 1980s to fund their own pensions through specialized private institutions. Getting rid of them was the overwhelming demand of the social uprising of 2019. Now, a group of deputies from the extreme right Independent Democratic Union Party introduced a draft constitutional reform establishing a quorum of three quarters in parliament in case a future progressive Congress intends to move the system onto a mixed scheme, controlled by the state as social movements and unions have demanded. Pension funds managers have the most powerful lobby in the country. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, during a working meeting on the Bicentennial 2021 University Admission System, denounced the repression of the government of Ivan Duque against the protesters, against the national strike in Colombia that has left, according to unofficial figures, at least 45 murdered youth and more than 600 disappeared. Tu colombiana tiene tres semanas en las calles. Colombian youth have been on the streets for three weeks, being massacred. In Colombia, more than 45 young people have been murdered, more than 600 missing people who do not know where they are. A massacre against the youth of Colombia, a massacre against all the people of Colombia just for wanting that youth a right to study, to education, to universities. In Colombia, all the right to study is privatized. There is no right to study. There is no right to education. Many Colombian families are making the decision to send their children to university age to study the university career in Venezuela because they know that it is free and of great quality. In this context, the Venezuelan head of state criticized the operational deployment throughout Colombia, ordered by the Duke president under the silence of the international community. Yesterday, while the Colombian National a strike committee was meeting with good intentions with the Colombian government to negotiate. Ivan Duque ordered the militarization of all cities in the country and the shooting of youth, indigenous people, workers and women. The cases of sexual abuse against young people that led to the suicide of a girl in Popoyan, how painful, heartbreaking. It's news you can't even hear. It's heartbreaking. And what the international community does, asks Venezuela. What the World Human Rights System does in the face of the massacre of Ivan Duque against the people of Colombia, what is done? Most euphemism, most silence, most complicity. The Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, recalled the social eruption of Chile at the end of 2019 against the government of Sebastián Piñera while stressing the victory of the Chilean people in the conventional constituent elections of last May 16th. Look what happened in Chile. The youth rose up against Piñera, against the neoliberal model, against Pinochet. That October 18, 2019, was the youth in the Chilean metro and the good, a popular wave rose in Chile until today, and it was the student youth of the schools, of the universities and of the neighborhoods in Chile who opened the way to a constituent process. Who would have thought that in Chile a constituent assembly would be called and a constituent assembly will be elected, and so did the people of Chile last Sunday. And the progressive forces, the forces of the future, the forces of the left, won a great victory against the Pinochet right, against Piñera. More news in a minute. Join us again after this. special program analyzing an interview by British researcher John McAvoy where he exposes the alliance between the United Kingdom and the coupist Venezuelan opposition and their conspiracies to overthrow the legitimate government of the Bolivarian nation. Today, only on Telesur. Innovation. Science. 
the technological breakthrough and its influence in society. Viajeros del saber, el futuro está aquí. Atomen. Monday, only on Telesur. Welcome back to From the South. On Tuesday in Italy, migrant farm workers gathered outside Parliament to demand the government's better working conditions. Hundreds of migrant workers in Italy protest in front of the Parliament with the purpose of demanding the authorities to be visible in the country and to have better working conditions because they live and work in the country without any legal status. With banners and slogans, the demonstrators, who are mostly agricultural workers, ask the government to consider residence permits, social security and a decent wage to facilitate the work in the country. On Tuesday, the Spanish government deployed troops to Ceuta to patrol the border with Morocco after thousands of asylum seekers arrived into the northern African country. According to the Spanish interior minister, Fernando Grande Marlaska, his government is working closely with Ceuta police in sensitive locations within the place to maintain order on the streets. The executive also said that in the last 24 hours, 6,000 Moroccans, including more than 1,000 children, had crossed the border into Ceuta. The sudden mass arrivals of asylum seekers has created a humanitarian crisis for Ceuta, a city of 85,000 people and separated from Morocco by a fence. Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez canceled a trip to Paris, where he was to attend a summit on international aid to Africa to turn his focus to the crisis with Morocco. The Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez promised to restore order at the borders after the influx of migrants into the Spanish enclave from Ceuta from neighboring Morocco. Several thousand people crossed the border from Morocco into the Spanish city of Ceuta. This surge of illegal migrants represents a serious crisis for Spain and also for Europe. In the name of the Spanish government, I want to convey to all Spaniards, and especially to those living in Ceuta and Melilla, that we will re-establish order in their city and our borders with the utmost speed. On Tuesday in India, authorities reported that at least 24 people died and almost 100 were missing after Cyclone Taktai hit the country's coast. The cyclone is the latest of a growing number of severe storms in the Arabian Sea blamed on climate change. With winds up to 130 km per hour, it smashed seafront windows and knocked over power lines and thousands of trees, blocking roads leading to affected areas. As a warning, authorities evacuated more than 200,000 people from danger zones. The deadly weather system hit just as India's healthcare system struggles with a coronavirus surge that in the past 24 hours recorded more than a thousand new confirmed cases. And we stay in India, at least 100 people are missing after a vessel adrift off Mumbai's coast sank during cyclone time. The Indian Navy said two ships and helicopters were deployed to assist in the search. The vessel was carrying 273 people. The Defense Ministry said 146 people were rescued from the vessel, which was operated by a state-run oil company, with operations expected to continue throughout the day in extremely difficult conditions. In China, construction of two new nuclear units with Russian technology will start this Wednesday. The presidents of China and Russia will attend the launching via video conference 
The units will be added to nuclear facilities at Tianwan and Sudapu. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson said that this year marks the 20th anniversary of the Russia-China Treaty of Friendship, Neighborhood and Cooperation. Nuclear energy is a traditional area of cooperation between the two countries, the spokesperson said. The new works are part of a set of strategic bilateral agreements signed during Russian President Vladimir Putin visit to China in 2018. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching. Wait about